Now, if you recall, if you were with us last week, um, the name Ecclesiastes means in the original Hebrew, the preacher. Now, this is an unusual book of wisdom. It's without a happy ending to the preacher's attempt to find if there is anything in this world that can truly satisfy the human heart. Now, his conclusion for the quest of meaning uh, of life, meaning of life under the sun apart from God is stated at the very beginning of the book. So he doesn't wait for you to get to the end. He just tips his hand right at the very beginning. And I want to re- remind us again by reading verses 1 and 2, and it says this. The words of the preacher, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity or meaninglessness, or if you like, it's like a vapor of steam. It's gone in a moment. Now, last week, we read of his attempt to to find the meaning of life through the accumulation of wisdom through education. Well, now, now he turns to another way. He turns to, to pleasure. He turns to pleasure to see if this can ultimately fill the interior hole that resides within his life. If you would, we're going to be reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and if you are trying to find your way there in your Bible, go to, it's one of the book of wisdom, so go to Job, then Psalms, should be right in the middle of your Bible, then Proverbs, then you come to Ecclesiastes. If you've gone to Song of Songs, you have passed it up and go back. If you have it on your electronic device, well, there you go. Reading the word of the Lord Chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 1 through 11 together. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. My heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself, I made myself gardens and parks and planted them in all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. This morning, the main point of this message is going to be this. A good laugh, strong drink, accomplishments in the good life bring momentary satisfaction, but lasting pleasure is only found in Jesus. Good laugh, strong drink, accomplishments in the good life bring momentary delight, momentary satisfaction, but lasting pleasure is found only in Jesus. If you would, let's pray and ask the Lord's Spirit to attend to the preaching of his word. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to sit under your word, to hear you speak to us. Lord, we thank you that this is in your category, your genre of wisdom, and so you have wisdom for us today. Lord, wisdom to live rightly before you, in the fear of you, in the delight of you, in the pleasure of being with you. So Father, help us. Holy Spirit, attend to this preaching. Lord, I pray that at the end, Lord, there would be clarity of one thing that you're calling us to do, each as individuals. 
whether it's something to believe, whether it's something to turn from, or whether it's something to do, regardless of what it is, bring clarity. Lord, we are your children, and we ask, speak, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's, let's get into it, okay? The preacher's pursuit of pleasure. See, the allure of pleasure promises to bring enjoyment to life. In verse 1, the preacher says to himself, Come now, I will test you to find out if the happy life is found in pleasure. Now, in order to make a careful study of this, of pleasure, he gives himself fully to it. He wants to make sure that every one of his senses has the chance to experience a thrill has the chance to experience the tingle of excitement. And so first, he turns to laughter. You see that in verse 2. I said about laughter, it is madness. And about pleasure, what does it accomplish? Now, you got to keep in mind, the preacher, as he's writing, we got to understand a little bit more about him. He was so wealthy. He was so wealthy that he hired comedians to come and to make him laugh. Guys like John Crisp. Kevin Hart, or Jim Gaffigan. He would have had all of the social media platforms at his disposal so that he could instantly pull up any episode of The Office to watch. He wanted to laugh. Now, all the Proverbs even give us something about the, the, the advantage that laughter can bring to our lives. See, Proverbs says... A joyful heart is good medicine, right? See, although laughter is good and it even produces and possesses medicinal purposes and properties, he finds ultimately that it can't heal him fully from the disease of his soul under the sun. And so that's why he even says it is madness. Laughter is madness because the feelings that we get from laughter They just don't last. Think about it. You're watching on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, or whatever. Maybe it's YouTube videos. But you finish watching your favorite comedy and it's done. What do you immediately do? You go back to the beginning. And let's start it again. Why? Because ultimately, this satisfaction, this pleasure that we seek from laughter, it just doesn't last. It's temporal. And so next, he moves to, in verse 3, strong drink. See, the preacher moved on to see if parting would ultimately give him and provide him the purpose in life that he longed for. So he parted and he brought out all the alcohol that he had. He had beer, he had wine, and it flowed aplenty. People would come to his parties And the reason they had come is because they knew the liquor would never run out. And so the party would ultimately would never end. It wasn't like Lionel Richie singing all night long. This was like all week long. Party, party, party. But in verse 3, it says this, that he did all this, listen, in moderation. See, he wasn't drunk. He was a little tipsy. But he wasn't drunk because he wanted to hold on to his mental faculties in order to evaluate. Remember, he is testing pleasure. He wants to see, does this really provide everything that I'm longing for? Is a strong drink really where it's at? Now, we don't know if he got tired of the monotony of all of his partying. We don't know if he got tired of people who woke up in his house that didn't remember the night before. We don't know any of this, but we do know this. The pursuit of the meaning of life through pleasure, it matured. Because he turns to enjoy pleasure through accomplishments. Look at verses 4 through 6. Now, I said last week that we don't know for certain if the preacher was, in fact, Solomon. But, but, if it is Solomon... We do know of Solomon's accomplishments because they are well documented, especially in 1 Kings. See, David was denied the privilege to build a house of the Lord, unto the Lord, unto God, even though he desired to, in the city of David in Jerusalem. Instead, that privilege was granted to Solomon. 
So Solomon takes upon this this holy and noble task to build a majestic house for the Lord. And it takes him seven years to accomplish it. Yet, as we continue on, if you read in 1 Kings, you realize that it took Solomon 14 years to build his own palace. See, he was invested, invested in pursuing pleasure by creating something and believing that it would ultimately satisfy him. See, notice all the times in verses four through six, he he writes this, I made, I built, I planted. I, I, I. See, he built a palace, built gardens, built national parks, houses for servants and wives. It was truly an architectural triumph, but all of this building was to selfishly provide his own enjoyment. See, it was not just a garden, but he planted a forest minus the forbidden fruit. See, just as God created the heavens and the earth and looked upon all that he had made and declared it good in Eden, this preacher pursued pleasure through his accomplishments of a private paradise. And with his success, he turns to derive pleasure from their fruits. And that is found in living the good life. Look at verses 7, and I'm going to pick up again verse 7 and 8, and also read verse 10. And he says this, I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of man. In verse 10, and whatever my eyes desired, hear this, I did not keep from them. Whatever I saw, I took it. See, the good life for him, it represented an army of slaves. Now, if you think about it, Why did he have an army of slaves? Well, it's because he wanted people who serve him. And and really, if you think about his life, this would have meant that he didn't do anything for himself anymore. Someone cooked for him. Someone picked up for him. He just literally, wherever he was, changed his clothes, drops his clothes, and somebody else is going to attend to it. Someone dressed him. Someone brushed his teeth. Someone even gave him massages, and you get the point. See, not only were there servants galore, but we also read that he had a ranch. And this private ranch had all kinds of animals upon it. Cattle, herds of cattle, goats, sheep, all for provision. Now, with his wealth, he really did take full advantage of all of it and all that it provided. See, instead of downloading music from, for himself from iTunes, he decided to buy literally his own band. Now, can you imagine, all right, can you imagine, if you will, someone's driving outside the palace walls, blaring their music from their camel? Just imagine that. The preacher, he hears it. Immediately, he has to find out who is this band that's producing this music. I love it. He finds out the name of the band. He goes and he buys them. He buys them. If you were around back then, you hear the news that the most popular band has just canceled their Jerusalem tour because now they are in the presence of this preacher who has bought them, not just for one night, but forever. I had singers, men and women. Now, he's not content with the music scene, though, because he moves on from there. He's not content with just being served by everyone because then he continues to his search for pleasure and that is derived the pleasure from the embrace of women. Again, I want to say this caveat. We don't know if the preacher was Solomon or not, but what we know of Solomon is that he was known to be quite the playboy. See, Solomon experienced uninhibited sexual desire that took him to, uh, to go ahead and take for himself 700 wives and 300 concubines, 1,000 women. 
Now, here's what I can say about this. Pretty categorically, he's not looking for love. If you were looking for love, it's hard enough to maintain that with one. (laughs) Amen? I don't hear any wives saying that, amen, but (laughs) should be, okay? He wasn't looking for love. He was looking for sex, believing it would provide him love. And so you would think after the first, ah, 10, might have clued in, but it took a 1,000. See, the good life for the preacher consisted of great fortune and (laughs) unimaginable amounts of sex. See, again, look in verse 10. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. Now, the preacher's pursuit of pleasure surpassed everyone who came before him. And what did he conclude from his chase for pleasure? Well, let's read the preacher's conclusion, if we can, in verses 10 and 11. I want you to look there. Because this is what the preacher says says to each one of us, he says, listen, partying was fun. Not going to lie to you. Building, creating something that would last. These accomplishments was a rush to the system, and it was great. The women, ha, huh, being served, having cold play at my disposal, The riches and the herds, all of it was great. That's his conclusion. Now, I can almost hear it. We're in church, and there's a lot of people who are Christians that don't like this conclusion. After all, we just want to say, you know what? All these things, apart from God, it doesn't bring any happiness. Well, That's not the conclusion the preacher reaches. But he reaches this conclusion saying it was fun, but he says it with a caveat. See, look at the end of verse 10. The preacher sums up what he got out of all of his pleasure. This is the fruit. He says this, and this was my reward for all my toil. Here's what he means. His conclusion is that pleasure was momentary. This is what I put into it. This is what I got out of it. It was good, but it was momentary. It was fleeting. It was here today and literally gone in a few seconds. And so he concludes in verse 11 of his study for pleasure to find the meaning of life. says this, when I considered all that I had accomplished and what I had labored to achieve, I found everything to be futile in a pursuit of the wind. You hear it again? Pursuit of the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. See, even all that he had built, do you know what remains from all of Solomon's buildings? Ditches. If you go to Jerusalem now, all that remains are ditches in hillsides that were the pools used to go ahead and provide water for the trees, the fruit trees that he had planted. The only thing that remains is a ditch. Isn't that fun? All of that work, it's all gone. And the preacher's experience, if we're honest, it resonates with us, doesn't it? See, in the end, partying, accomplishments, living the good life, it didn't satisfy his desire for pleasure. And if we're honest, if we're truly honest, we can say the same things as well. We're talking lasting pleasure, nothing that's fleeting. Now, I tremble to go ahead and read this this interview, the contents of this interview because of the Philadelphia Eagle fans among us, but I endeavor to use it for illustrative purposes anyway, so don't throw anything at me. But in an interview on 60 Minutes, a few weeks after winning his third Super Bowl, Tom Brady, the quarterback for the New England Patriots, said the following. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think that there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, 
This is what is. Well, I reached my goal, my dream, my life. But me, I think it's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. Pinnacle of accomplishments if you are a professional football player. And his conclusion sounds eerily similar to the preacher's conclusion, doesn't it? David Hubbard, who is a, who's a uh, writer of commentaries, Christian commentaries, wrote this. He says, pleasure's advertising agency is much more effective than its manufacturing department. <laughs> See, it's just another way of saying this, that pleasure apart from God makes great promises, but it can never deliver upon them. It's vanity. See, nothing, he says, is gained by pleasure because it's, it's elusive. It's, it's like hurting the wind. I can't keep it. it it's, it's gone. It's gone past me. Can I find something else? See, the life of pleasure under the sun leaves us wanting for more because we're never satisfied. It, think about this. If you are denied pleasure, what is your response? You get angry and frustrated. That's your fruit. If you get pleasure, what is the fruit? You get bored with it. You move on. Why do you think video games will be here for the rest of our existence? Because they've got to create another game to attempt to satisfy, to attempt to bring us joy. You beat the game. Oh, but you, you beat it on private mode. Now you got to go to captain mode and try it again. And then you got to go to general mode and you got to try it all over again. And then Call of Duty 27 comes out next month. And let's try it again. It never satisfies. Think, one drink often leads to another. One sexual, sexual encounter, well, it needs another. One mission accomplished needs another rush. See, only temporal satisfaction is found in life under the sun. So let me ask, before we move on, where has your pursuit of pleasure apart from God led you? Where has your pursuit of pleasure led you? We're not just bystanders. To live, ultimately, is to worship. To live is to pursue happiness. To live is to seek to maximize the most joy we can possibly squeeze out of life. Where has your pursuit taken you? Is it drinking? Is it drugs? Is it Facebook? Is it all the social media platforms? And listen, the only reason I bring this up is because all of these social media platforms elicit the same amount of endorphins into our system, in our brain, that other activities do as well, meaning it's addictive. Is it sexual immorality? Is it, I've been married 20 years, but you know what? Things are a little stale and boring. But my coworker, who, you know what, happens to be attractive, there might be something there. Is it porn? Is it binging and watching Netflix? Here's the follow-up question. In all of these, do you see the emptiness of these pursuits apart from God? Do you see it? See, this conclusion of the preacher in Ecclesiastes is not meant to lead us to despair or to depression, but it prepares us to find our pleasure above the sun. It prepares us to pursue our pleasure in God. See, the preacher prepares us for lasting pleasure. The world really does believe that God is a cosmic killjoy. If you were to go out and just poll 
people. If, you, if today was a nice day and you were to go, go out to, let's say, the Philadelphia uh, Art Museum and all the traffic that's going by and all the people that are walking, running, and all the other things that are going on, riding bikes or whatever, and you stop some people in a friendly way, okay? Not in a harsh way, but in a friendly way. And you just ask them, hey, what do you, who is God and what do you think he's like? I'm telling you, nine times out of ten, what you're going to get is God keeps us from things. God says no. God is, in their minds, a cosmic killjoy. See, he's become the enemy to happiness, joy, and satisfaction. But here's the interesting thing. God ultimately is the author of all good times. See, consider with me the storyline of history, just Creation, fall, and redemption. Just consider this. God in creation created Adam and Eve in the garden, and they wore nothing. Nothing. One man, one woman, a bunch of land, lots of fruit, and they were naked. And they were not ashamed. See, God wasn't opposed to their pursuit of pleasure and enjoyment. See, he created it. God created pleasure for Adam and Eve. And God literally says, listen, go, abound, have a great time, and by all means, be fruitful and multiply. This is God giving the, go for it, buddy. Enjoy. I've created this for you as a couple. Think about all of this fruit as well, just the fruit from the trees of God's garden. See, God wasn't annoyed with Adam and Eve and said, listen, you didn't eat all the grapes before they started to spoil. No, God created grapes so that when they weren't eaten, there's something else that would be produced from them. Fermentation produces wine. God created it, a little wine. Here's something to enjoy. All of this, all of these good times were created by God himself. And, and, and we got to stop reading our Bibles like there's just chronological. It's like day one, day two, day three, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, God rested and boom, the fall happened. No, we don't know the interval, okay, between all of this creative activity and when the fall took place, which means they had time to enjoy God and enjoy one another, newsflash, with God being with them. See, God is not a cosmic killjoy, but something did happen to destroy the creative creative order of pleasure. See, in the fall, on Adam and Eve, they choose, choose is the key word. They didn't stumble into this. They chose to believe a lie fed to them from a disgruntled, disgruntled fallen angel and eat fruit that was forbidden them. A shady dude in the form of a serpent. The essence of this lie was this. God doesn't really want you to be happy and to enjoy your life. Move on from God. Find happiness, find pleasure, find joy on your own. So their distrust of God, which led to their sinful disobedience, brought terrible consequences, not just to Adam and Eve, but to all the earth. See, Adam and Eve were thrown out of paradise. They were clothed with animal skins because it was no longer acceptable just to be nude anymore. And they left seeking to find pleasure apart from God. As God ushers them out of the paradise, out of the Garden of Eden, he makes an amazing promise that one day he'd send send someone to restore order again. One day. Now, we are Adam and Eve's descendants. And we've become very adept at creating new ways to dull and to suppress our God-given, hardwired desires for pleasure. See, we're created with a deep longing and a thirst for happiness and joy, every single one of us. 
And as a result of the fall, though, we have all denied in our hearts that God exists. And instead, we have pursued pleasure apart from him. Literally looking for love and looking for pleasure in all the wrong places. In all of us. None of us are immune to this. Because Romans 1.25 sums up our existence due to the fall, and it sums it up very well. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. That's all of us. It's all humanity. This is what we've given our lives to. And this lie that God is an enemy of joy and will never make us happy. And so we have lived for and served counterfeit gods. Good times, relationships, achievement, sexual satisfaction, love, instead of living for God, our creator. See, life under the sun apart from God is simply a series of fleeting and momentary pleasure that never, ever lasts. Now, remember I said that we were hardwired for pleasure, meaning we were created in the very core of our DNA. Well, the preacher says it this way. If you look ahead in Ecclesiastes, he he writes, he, meaning God, he's referring to God, has put eternity into man's heart. That's what God has done. He has put eternity into our hearts. God has created man to enjoy pleasure with him And to do this forever. No interruptions. That's how we were created. And even our fallen state has not jettisoned that specific part of our DNA. We were all created to live for all eternity. We were never created to experience death. But that simply is the just penalty by God for our sinful disobedience. Death, separation from God, just like Adam and Eve, is our existence. If you don't believe me, consider this. This is from C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. And he writes this. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, well, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. God has put eternity in our hearts. Life under the sun is not all there is, Tom Brady. There's something more. And this preacher's conclusion of a meaningless life prepares his audience, prepares us for something that is more, that says there is real, true, and lasting meaning to our lives. Now, a few years later, a prophet speaks into the hopelessness of the world. It's a message about God's promise to restore a man to a right relationship with him and satisfy our desires for pleasure. Remember, God made a promise to Adam and Eve, and so God sends a prophet, someone who will remind them God hasn't forgotten his promise. And so in Isaiah 55, we read this. Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the water, and you, without silver, come by and eat. That makes no sense. Don't have any money, but come and buy anyways. This is what God is saying to us. Come, buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. It's in verse 2. Why do you spend silver on what is not food and your wages on what does not satisfy? Instead, listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And you will enjoy the choices of foods. Pay attention and come to me. Listen so that you will live. As he's ushering Adam and Eve out of the garden, I will send one who will restore us again. And the joy that you had before you disobeyed will come to you again. Because our relationship will be restored as he's ushering them out. But listen to what the prophet Isaiah is writing now. He's saying, you don't have to even search for me. I'm coming to you and I'm welcoming you back. I have something for you. I have a way 
for us to be reconnected. Now, Isaiah poses the question to each of us. How long will we keep looking for lasting pleasure in the wrong things? How long? Isaiah dies, people for hundreds of years still seeking lasting pleasure under the sun, looking to have their hunger and their thirst for pleasure and meaning to be satiated, but only coming up completely dry and empty. Yet God sends Jesus. Now listen to Jesus' words and hear them clearly. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. See, Jesus says, in essence, I am the one promised by God to restore men and women to God. And he accomplished this by willingly dying on a cross to pay the penalty for all our sins. Now, pause here. If you're a Christian, you have heard that probably, especially if you've been raised in the church like I have, a gazillion times without exaggeration. And it can go in one ear right out the other. So stop with me for a second and picture this. Jesus existed for all history, all eternity, before literally time began at one. And he existed in this state. Glory. There are beings just created. Glory. Holy are you, Jesus. We delight in you alone. There's nothing greater. Nothing greater than you. Eternal glory in his existence. And yet in a magnificent and really, if you just think about it for a second, dumbfoundingly confusing, turn your world upside down way, he sets it aside. He says, I'm coming now. This is what always amazes me about Christmas time. I still have the question. Okay, I get it. You came. Incarnate. Get it. Please help me understand. Why? In my depravity, in my faithlessness, in the countless times I distrust you and trust my own self more. Why would you come? See, Jesus lays glory in the pleasure he derived from it, which is rightfully his, aside. It says in John 1.12, and he came to a people who did not receive him. That's just a kind word, kind way of saying they hated him. They hated him. They thought he was whack. Oh, this Jesus dude, you know what? There's something wrong with that guy. Oh, he says he's the son of God? Well, there you go. Crazy. And they did not receive him. See, what did Jesus do in 40 days after he was, at the beginning of his ministry, after he was baptized? He went out into the desert and he fasted and prayed for 40 days. I fast after one day, I'm weak. Okay? 40 days. Imagine the weakness. And Satan comes, just like he came to Adam and Eve. Hey, Jesus, listen, you're hungry, dude. Why don't you take this stone and just proclaim it and say, you're a loaf of bread now. Eat be satisfied. Do this on your own. This will satisfy you. And Jesus, in all the temptations that the enemy threw at him, 
He denied him. He stopped Satan cold in his tracks. See, Jesus not only did that right in terms of denying temporal pleasure, but he was sinless for 33 years. Never a lustful glance at the woman who lived down the street. Never a wanton thought towards adulteress that may have lived around and had notorious reputations. Never drinking and imbibing too much at the wedding. Trying to escape this monotony of life. Never seeking pleasure apart from God. And then we see Jesus, the night that he's betrayed, he's in another garden. Isn't that good news? See, where Adam and Eve screwed up in a garden, Jesus was successful in a garden. See, Jesus says, listen, if there's another way, if there's another way for people to be redeemed and restored to you, make it happen. But not my will be done but yours instead. Knowing the horrific agony that awaited him. Denying the pleasure of all his eyes could see. And choosing instead pleasure that comes with God, not apart from God. For we later read in Hebrews that for the joy that was set before Jesus, he endured the cross scorning its shame, but through the means of the cross, paying the penalty, the just penalty, for all mankind's sin, so that we can be restored and forgiven relationally to a holy God. And not just temporally, but forever. Why was it for the joy? Well, it was because the joy that he knew this would accomplish. This was going to bring about lasting pleasure that all mankind is desperately yearning for, desperately looking for. See, for those who have received Jesus' offer of new life, Jesus' death has truly paid the penalty for all of our guilty pleasures pursued apart from God. We are forgiven and restored into a peaceful and a pleasing relationship with God. And this is all amazing grace. And today, Jesus still cries out to everyone, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now, we're going to close here because I believe the Lord would want us, a right response is to pursue, pursue pleasure above the sun. Or stated differently, pursue pleasure in the sun, S-O-N. Now, the preacher's quest to find meaning of, the meaning of life through pleasure apart from God led to him rightly concluding that all of life doing this is meaningless, meaningless. And maybe if you're here and the truth of the preacher's conclusion, it, it, it seems to resonate with you. It's, it's contemporary. It's real. Maybe you're you're here and you've sought to find meaning through an endless quest, endless quest of one experience of pleasure after another, after another, and yet you are left honestly to assess that there must be more to this life than this. I do not like the Rolling Stones, but I do appreciate their song, the most famous song, because it's truth. I can't get no satisfaction. Whatever I pursue, it eludes me. It is fleeting. It doesn't stay to the next day. If you're here, I am so glad that you are present. And I want to encourage you, you are, you are here without a, without a doubt. It is not by accident that you're listening. See, God in his kindness, in his compassion, in his mercy, in his immense love, knows you. He is speaking to you, and he has welcomed you to find true and lasting pleasure in him. 
Now, to, to start a new relationship with God, all you have to do is believe that Jesus is the Son of God and he paid the penalty for all of your sin by dying on a cross for you. In exchange for your sin, he offers you instead a new relationship with God where you experience pleasures that never end simply from being in his presence, being with him. Psalm 16, 11, great passage of scripture. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. See, God alone can quench your thirst and satisfy your hunger for more because he is eternal. He never runs out of ways to satisfy us, ever. And that's what's going to make heaven so enjoyable for Christians as well. It will be the complete antithesis to boredom because God will show us new ways, new things about himself and his great love for us. And we'll be, wow, that was stunning. Can't wait to see. Oh, I was going to say what tomorrow brings, but look at what it's brought already. Okay, that's what heaven's going to be like. Now, for those of you who are not a Christian, it requires faith for you to receive Jesus' offer of salvation for you. But here's a question. What requires more faith, to receive Jesus or to keep looking in all the wrong places? When's it going to end? What requires more faith? Because obviously, it ain't working. Listen, don't just take a chance. Believe it. (laughs) Do yourself right by pursuing the hardwired pleasure that you were wired with and seek to find it in Jesus Christ. See, God sent Jesus Christ and he died for your sins. Confess it, believe it, and you will be saved. If you want to talk afterwards, I'd be happy to talk with you. But you don't need me to talk to you. You can have others who are around you pray with you and encourage you to find lasting joy and satisfaction in God alone, to be reconnected through Jesus Christ and the gospel. For Christians, this morning, this is This is good news of what God has done for us through Jesus. And this good news is meant to be believed and also applied to our lives every day. Every day. No days off. Now, if you are like me, if you are like me, the the putting together of this message serves as a wonderful opportunity to be rescued yet again by God. Why are, you, why are you trying to serve and pursue pleasure apart from me? You're right. See, God is, is seeking to rescue us from seeking pleasure apart from God that doesn't leave us satisfied. Now, we can do this in a variety of ways, whether it be laughing at things that dishonor God, whether it be abusing alcohol by numbing ourselves, so that we don't experience the monotony of everyday life. It could be using social media as a means to derive pleasure through the number of likes or forwards or whatever that people pay attention to us. See, the longing of significance and and deriving pleasure that way can be momentary. There's no question about it. But if our longing turns to find fulfillment in other people, we will be left empty. Please hear me. It is futile. And you don't believe me, think this way. When you wake up in the morning, what are your first thoughts and what do you grab first? Is it your phone? Nothing wrong with your phone. What are you looking for on your phone? We can live every day and live unexamined lives. And God wants to put the brakes on that. Say, wait a second, wait a second. I've got so much more than what ESPN has for you. 
There's more to life than Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Pinterest, whatever. There's always going to be something new, right? There's more. See, music, concerts, movies, all these can be great, but if you find that you're engaging in these things apart from God, then that's a problem. Listen, Solomon's problem wasn't, the, the problem wasn't that he enjoyed sex. That was not his problem. His problem was that he would go ahead and pursue any means apart from God to enjoy sex. That was the problem. The very first wife that he had was the daughter of Pharaoh. God had explicitly commanded, have no foreign wives, dude. And you continue reading in 1 Kings, and you're like, good Lord, the princess of Monica? Or Monaco or whatever. I mean, just all the audacious people. A Moabitess. All these people that God said, don't mix with. Because when you do, they're going to lead you astray. See, this was pleasure that he was pursuing apart from God. If he would have just picked a good Jewish woman. (laughs) A good girl just from down the street. But he didn't. See, the problem of our pursuits of finding pleasure apart from God is that they become ultimately God replacements. And they become God replacements with a catch. And there's two of them. The first one is this. It does yield temporary pleasure. All right? So parents, you can be honest with your kids. Temporary pleasure. Okay? Fine print is this. That you're enslaved to it. That's the fine print. It demands our pursuit of pleasure without the joy of guiltlessness. Instead, pleasure, enslaved by it, guilty. Pleasure apart from God. See, these God replacements dull our ability to experience true pleasure in God. True pleasure is experienced by faith in a good father who loves us And listen, please listen to this. He is committed to our good and our freedom. And they're not diametrically opposed. Our goodness, he is committed to our pleasure. So if you find yourself this morning being rescued by God, encouragement is this. If the gospel is what we are called to cling to every day, then we are called to confess that we have wandered from the Lord and we are called to return to him right now. Not tomorrow, but right now. See, we are called to trust that God forgives, but also our distrust that he satisfies, we're called to go ahead and put that to death and say, God, I trust you. I believe you have good for me. Seek him again. Put away the counterfeits and turn to him because the gospel has made a way that we can have a relationship with God, the author of good times. And lastly, this would be for all Christians, and I appreciate your attentiveness in this. Please be aware that the worldly pursuit of pleasure apart from God is being done every day by your friends, your neighbors, your classmates, your coworkers, and family members, and it is leaving them, despite what they put on Facebook, empty. We have the privilege, Christians, to share the truth, brothers and sisters, that there really is more to life under the sun. We are called as Christians to live it out and to speak it out, to share the good news of God's mercy, to restore all that was broken in Eden, but what Jesus has done to restore lasting and enduring pleasure that doesn't just end in this life, but extends for all eternity. Let's be aware and let's tell them. Let's tell them. Don't keep it to yourself. See, a good laugh, strong drink, accomplishments in the good life bring momentary satisfaction, but lasting pleasure is found in Jesus alone. I want to invite the worship team forward. If you would, would you please stand as I pray? Father, as I pray,
prayed at the beginning. Lord, I want to pray here now as we close. Lord, I do ask and I thank you that you've promised that your word would not return void. Lord, that it would accomplish its intended design. Lord, and the intended design of this book of Ecclesiastes is to cause us to pursue our pleasure, to pursue our delight, to pursue the truth of the meaning to our existence in our lives in you. And so, Holy Spirit, I just, I just ask right now, if you're calling some to believe this, the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time, Lord, that you, by your grace, you give strength and power to do so even right now. Lord, if you're calling some to turn from pleasure-seeking counterfeit gods that we have pursued apart from you, Lord, by grace, give us strength to turn and to turn towards you. And Father, I pray for all Christians here that you give us voice that being in love with you is amazing because we recognize the fact that you have loved us first and you don't stop. And because you don't stop, we have some amazing good news to share with everyone we come in contact with. And so Father, give us voice. Lord, and I pray as a result that you would, that there would be a harvest of souls who are empty right now, but, but find their joy and their lasting pleasure in you alone. So that make it so. Make it so, we pray. And all God's people said, amen.